Okay, welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Bradley Horowitz. I'm one of the VPs of product here at Google, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to this Authors at Google talk with Jersey Gregorick. And uh, Jersey is an amazing individual, and I'm learning that the more I get to know him and his family, who is also here over time. Uh, the reason nominally that we're here is because he is a world expert uh, in weightlifting. He's a champion in weightlifting and world record holder. Um, but more generally in the categories of fitness, health, nutrition, aging, wellness. He's also made some incredible contributions that are documented in his book, The Happy Body. Um, beyond that, what I'm learning is that the story uh, that brought him on this journey is equally engaging and entertaining. And this takes us into realms of mindfulness, philosophy, stoicism, and that will be woven through. So it's not just about diet and exercise, although those things are are core to his message. Um, it's also about uh, his own journey and how he came upon this knowledge uh, through direct experience. So first I'd like to all uh, take a moment and thank and welcome Jersey here. Okay, to kick things off, you're Polish, but you left that country when it was communist 31 years ago. Why did you leave? And I heard at the time you were already trained for the Olympics and were also a firefighter. Oh, before I answer, thank you for inviting me. Pleasure. And I am so happy that uh, my wife and my daughter is here. So uh, I've been married for 39 years. <laughs> and that's a big achievement. And uh, we have a lovely daughter that is 13 years old and we are so happy. And uh, so um, I, uh, I was 13 when <coughs> I uh, began Olympic weightlifting. And why I did it, it was, well, you know, in Poland, people were big <laughs> and tall and strong. So uh, I was short and, and weak, so I wanted to uh, find edge for myself and work on myself so those who are very strong uh, would not really push me around. So I started weightlifting and uh, really fell in love with weightlifting. It was just really fun. And as I became stronger and stronger, it didn't matter anymore that uh, uh, the bullies were there. So it just disappeared. But uh, I continued uh, lifting and, and more lifting and, and falling more in love with it. And then when I was 19, I was an athlete already. And and in Poland, it was the time that uh, athletes could go to the fire department and stay there and compete uh, for the team. So I ended up to be a fireman. And uh, I didn't expect what would happen to me in the fire department, but it was uh, uh, quite, a, quite interesting uh, situation. And uh, the first time when I uh, went to the fire, I was in the fire engine, I was 19 years old, and I was going there, and I felt this overwhelming feeling of goodness. It was uh, uh, the feeling of being needed, and I've never felt that such a thing, but it was very strong, and I liked it. It was very pleasurable and joyful. So I, uh, from that moment on, I, uh, I loved the fire department. I like to be a fireman, just right there. So after three years when I, uh, I could leave the fire department as if I was in the army, I st stayed in the fire department. And then I, uh, um, after about five years, I uh, applied to the fire academy in Warsaw and started studying there. And uh, it was 78. And I studied for four years. So I studied uh, in the fire. Oh, that's my uh, weightlifting, actually, time and competing. And that's the solidarity time. In 1981, uh, solidarity uh, was uh, at the stake of fighting with the government. And then the government uh, did everything so they could use more powers to fight demonstrations. And they tried to uh, take the fire department and 
put the fire, fire department into the um, army, kind of a paramilitary. So they could use the whole fire department against demonstrations. Well, we said, no, we don't like that idea. And we went on strike. And I was one of the leaders uh, at the strike. And then the strike was, uh, after negotiations for 10 days, was brutally put down. And uh, they took us out. They sent uh, terrorist uh, brigade and, and, and tanks and took us out. And after that, I found myself underground. And uh, from after nine years, after being the fireman, suddenly underground. The government formed a new academy under a different name and asked students to sign their allegiance to, uh, to the new place. But it was against completely my ethics and, and morals, and I didn't. So I started being underground. During this time, uh, during this time when uh, I was uh, in the uh, academy during the strike, uh, it was a very difficult time emotionally, and uh, people were under extreme stress. And so there were students, and there were 400 of us. And um, there was a priest who came to help us, to uh, guide us. And that priest was uh, love of the country. He was uh, like Martin Luther King. And uh, his sermons were uh, very uh, inspiring and helping uh, Polish uh, people to survive, to survive this difficult time. And uh, the government hated him so much at the time, the communist government, that they uh, set up uh, capturing him. And, and after the, they captured him in 84, they would... Uh, uh, they would um, torture him and then uh, and uh, murder him. Then, so he uh, that was eighty four. Uh, we lost uh, Jersey. It was uh, it was a very uh, difficult time for Poland in eighty four. And uh, uh, I was at the time it was coincidence because I was at the time called to the police department in Szczecin and. When I was there, I was lucky because somebody told me that I should leave and because where I was, I would never walk out. So I, uh, I ran and then uh, I went to uh, Sweden in 1985. So I left Poland, Poland, a country that I extremely love, but it was the time to go. So Poland to Sweden. And was it easy to get out of Poland, or did you have to sort of sneak out? You say you were underground. Could you just it, show up with a passport? And <laughs> it was the time when uh, the government really didn't like the uh, troublemakers. So uh, you could get uh, the passport and they were out, happy out to of see the, you go out of yeah, the country. One less problem. Yeah. Yeah. So when uh, when I went to Sweden, then uh, I uh, went to the Solidarity again in Stockholm, and, and then I faced a different situation. A lot of uh, people from Solidarity were divided from their families. And uh, there were hunger strikes and all uh, possible scenarios of pain and suffering. And then I, uh, I tried to help people and talk to people and then found myself actually helping uh, them. So it, how it happened, I think, uh, it was because when I was exposed to Jersey and uh, Severin Ivorsky was another one, uh, people had, uh, during the solidarity, something what I've never seen, and that was unconditional love. It was just people who loved people. It was just amazing. I've never seen anything. I was 27 years old, and I thought I was I always I was always suspicious that you know people who have unconditional love they just pretend this thing, and uh, I was exposed to that, and I was exposed to that for about three years. 
So when I ended up to be in Sweden, I, uh, I started doing some things and I could actually uh, find the right wor words for the, in, for the right person at the right time that uh, I would help people to accept the painful situation and find a solution to survive and to go on. So in Sweden, you were still involved with the Polish emigres and sort of connected to what was going on there. And at some point, you left Sweden and came to the US with basically nothing but the shirt on your back. What, tell, us, tell us a little bit about what happened leaving Sweden. <laughs> so when, uh, when we left Sweden, uh, we pack everything into this huge bag, one bag. And uh, even our wedding rings were there because they told us that uh, there are metal detectors, so we have to have everything in our bag and not on us, especially metal. So when we came to New York, we were sent to Detroit. We came to New York, and then um, our luggage appeared, so we put it to Detroit. And when we arrived in Detroit, the luggage was not there. <laughs> so, uh, you know, everything what, was, what we had was in this one bag. And uh, we had clothes on and $1,000. That's all we got. And uh, I remember Aniela was very uh, upset about the whole situation. And I said, you know what? Maybe life, you know, wants us to be clean. <laughs> so we start clean and nothing, nothing there. <laughs> Did they ever find the luggage? No. You should file a ticket on that. <laughs> so, they gave, a, they gave the us hundred, no, $400. <laughs> that's what we got for this, the whole thing. So By pound. You're, you're, you're literally, I mean, sometimes people use it as an expression, nothing but the shirt on your back. But you literally had nothing. What next? Where do you go? Where do you turn? How do you rebuild from nothing? So uh, we landed in uh, LA. Eventually, we were in Detroit. We bought the tickets to um, to LA because we wanted to be in Santa Monica and you know in the place where sunshine, sunshine and training yep, and yep. bodybuilding and yep. so on, fitness. So we uh, landed uh, before we landed really in, to LA. I saw all this swimming pools up there, you know? and it's huge, LA is huge, right? So, you know, when I saw actually this hugeness, I just thought, wow, all these people found themselves, so we'll find them <laughs> ourselves there too, <laughs> right? So that actually helped, because it was just so, oh, millions of people, wow, they are good, we will be good. And uh, I told Daniel, I, you know, uh, we probably buy a house in two years with a pool, we've never had a pool, but it was kind of a, a dream and joke too. Anila thought that I was crazy. I lost myself <laughs> in this whole situation. But two years after, you know, we, uh, we bought a house with a pool. Uh, of course, we bought it when the house was really the high price and Northridge earthquake came and then we had to foreclose the house. But <laughs> that's okay too. It's, it's, uh, it's um, uh, life happens to you and then um, not always good things happen. Sometimes, you know, just bad things happen. But the more important is how we adapt to those things and not really uh, uh, something else. But uh, at that time when we landed eventually in LA, we uh, found this Polish couple that helped us to uh, sleep and to be in this uh, house uh, behind that they were building and we slept there for about a month, and then uh, they helped us to stand up, and it was really great. But uh, the first thing that we, what we did to find the job, we walked to uh, walk around and, and try to find the connections. We found the president of American Weightlifting Association, Bob Heiss, who told us that weightlifting coaches don't have any work. CrossFit was not existent, so uh, nobody wanted weightlifters, <laughs> weightlifting coaches. But was this he, about 90? I mean, time it was 86. Was 86, okay. But he said, there is something new coming out, which is called personal trainer. So he said, some coaches like to train regular people. Some don't like. They just like athletes, and that's it. So I said, well, maybe we'll find. He said, where to find this? 
you know, people. And he said, well, I don't know. They are somewhere in gyms. So I said, okay. So we started walking from Los Feliz. And Thursday we went to Glendale and then we started walking all days. And in about two weeks we walked to Burbank. And we found the power source and uh, we told what, what, who we were. And, and Aram gave us the first job, personal trainer. And what, uh, uh, what our job was is to write uh, programs and strategies and plans for people that uh, came and wanted to improve something. And that could be anything. It could be uh, flexibility, it could be energy, it could be uh, weight loss, it could be uh, pains and get rid of medications, anything, right? So, and then I really found myself like I really like it. I like it. And whatever I wrote and uh, whatever I gave people worked and people really like it. And then I, I had probably 100 clients within three, four months. Wow. It was very fast. I Just was busy. Just word of mouth and uh, people sharing. Yeah, three, four months I, I was working 16 hours a day, Saturday and Sunday. So uh, we were happy. We, we moved into this little uh, cottage and it was, uh, the life was started really being great. And so you sort of invented yourself and invented this practice of life coaching, training, helping people. Um, nobody handed you a manual. There was no job description. You just sort of went with it and it led to a flourishing business. The threads of that, is that really led to happy body? Is this sort of a continuation from those early days? So it was the time uh, in 92, um, Aniela thought that we could start Olympic weightlifting back because I was injured in Poland. I was 23, I was paralyzed and uh, I had to stop uh, Olympic weightlifting. And uh, during the process of recovery, I uh, learned a lot about body and, and back and, and how to heal the body system. And uh, I did everything in order to get myself uh, stronger and, and stronger and not challenge the body to the extreme. So microprogression was one of the ways uh, to do. But it took years. It was 92 and Daniela said, we are so strong, maybe we should go and compete. Uh, we were already uh, past uh, 35, I will go to it, the, the, when the master division starts. And uh, we started, I, I said, okay, well, then we have to do some kind of uh, adjustments. So I uh, check our body fat, our powers, and so on, and, and uh, it came out that we, uh, I had to lose 60 pounds, and I uh, 30, <laughs> and we did in one year. So I projected the uh, numbers and uh, outlined everything and within one year. I came from 190 to 130, uh, you don't what have I am now. pictures yeah. of this, do you? I'd love to see the before be, and after. It's hard yeah, to imagine. I, have, I don't have it here. <laughs> but uh, I have myself 60. at 190. <laughs> yeah, wow. <laughs> but I was strong 190. It was not really. I had so much fat. Uh, yeah, that was a, kind of a bodybuilding training and powerlifting bodybuilding mostly. So we went into uh, Olympic weightlifting. 93, uh, we competed uh, on the uh, local level and then uh, nationals. And then uh, Pan American Games, 93, 94, and uh, 95, uh, we entered the World Championship. And 97 was the, the number that Aniela wanted to really uh, happen. And that, that was the World Championship in Poland. Oh, wow. And the last competition that I did, it was 77. At the same city, actually. That had you been to after. Poland since, or no? You, like, were you able to visit in the interview? After '89. Okay. After '89, yeah. a magical place, a magical thing happened in '89, right? That just the whole thing collapsed. It was just amazing. It was just beautiful yeah, to to watch Berlin Wall going down, and you know, yeah, I was a part of it. It was just. Uh, uh, an amazing fight with such an overwhelming power what the communism was. Uh, you could easily lose your life or uh, you could easily be forced to uh, obey and, and express that. It was just a very debilitating system that actually uh, 
went down. And it was just, for me, such a surprise. Nobody would imagine in 85 and 86 that this will happen in three or four days. So you had People the thought, opportunity to go back to a Poland that you loved and was restored to the Poland you wanted it to be and to compete. Right. So how'd that go? Well, that's uh, where we, we, we went to Poland to compete in 97 and there were you know, Polish coaches there and American coaches and I represented America there. And then um, I won the championship and then yeah, as well. They called us golden couple. <laughs> but when I stood on the, on the first place and I heard national anthem and, and it was American and I was in Poland and there was the Polish coaches and then American coaches, uh, it was so special. But, but there was something with, uh, uh, with weightlifters that before, they, before they, the competition, during competitions, they're really rough and tough to win. Everybody wants to win. But after, you don't feel like there is a country, just, you know, friends. Humanity, yep. Yeah, it's just beautiful. It's, uh, I, I guess it's everywhere with athletes, maybe, yeah. So this takes us through your journey, the triumphant return to Poland, the world championship, and um, shifting gears a little bit, like, let's, let's talk about your program, the Happy Body, um, and I know you have some slides to show us as well as uh, maybe a few videos. So um, let's, let's continue the journey post-97. So, so go, we, let's go to two, 2002. In 2002, we compete in Melbourne. There's a Master Olympics, and we are there. And there are uh, athletes between 35 and 100, and 100 something. The first time we see this scope of athletes. And there is a sprinter about 102, and then uh, at the stadium he talks to people, and he talks like he is 50 years old. It's just amazing that you know, when you see people at that age behaving that way and having this uh, incredible mind and, and health and, and youthfulness, it's just amazing. So I went to see uh, old weightlifters competing and then uh, I saw Charlie Henderson, and he was 80 years old. And he, um, uh, he came and, and he was going to lift uh, the weight equals his body weight. And I was looking at that, and I was just thinking, wow, that's incredible, 80-year-old doing this. And, you know, it's it just like I'm a poet, so I, I was transported into this life when I was a teenager and then it is, you know, we were doing this street lifting and whoever was stronger and so on. So the best of us could do it, the, the lifting the, the body weight. So um, I was just thinking, this guy is doing this. Just, he is as strong as, as the teenagers or 20s up there, right? So uh, this is crazy. So I thought, wow, that should be my standard to create the program and to uh, create the standard from this eight-year-old and transfer the Olympic weightlifting to find the, the exercise that would, uh, people could perform and uh, would gain this power and the strength at that level and have it throughout life. And that was the idea. Now, uh, the routine, of course, would need to cover a lot of things. So flexibility, everything would people want that could make the power that could make people uh, uh, stronger and, and live life in a better way. So that would be flexibility. People need flexibility. People need strength. People need uh, speed, coordination, posture, certain ideal body weight. So that would food uh, would be needed to, to cover. And then exercise system that would uh, correct all the problems and and the system had to be uh, reactive, reactive to the problems that people already had, knee problems, hip problems, and all the problems with the body. And uh, micro-progression had to be implanted in the training system. So, uh, so we did that. But also, uh, there was something else that uh, people had that we, when we trained them. It was that people were under extremely stress. So the the training, the, the routine, the exercise routine had to be mindful 
had to be pleasurable, joyful, so people throughout the life would uh, come back to it. And also, it, it had to be singular focus. So singular focus had to be implanted in the, in the routine. And that's what we did. And started being magical. So people started really uh, getting better. Uh, and the program um, worked, but still the program needed uh, some adjustment on the mind side. So it was really the inspiration from Charlie seeing what an 80-year-old could do that sort of led you to the work that led into the happy body and your system. Right. Yeah. So uh, I, would, uh, I would talk about aging and would like to show you what really happens and what I understood in 2002. And uh, so, you know, when we really... Uh, are born and then we until about 18 everything is good for us we're getting better we're getting stronger and life really helps us to really get better whether we uh, do anything or not we are actually getting better <laughs> so then it goes uh, then uh, that something happens at uh, about 18 and 35 where athletes compete against each other and it doesn't matter whether they are 35 or 18. Everyone can win in between. So this is the flat area. But th this is the flat area where really people have families, business, and children, and so on. This is the, the flourishing, the most beautiful time and most powerful time. But after that, uh, everything goes down. And then, uh, then no matter what, the, the life actually is doing the opposite. Life is... Uh, uh, aging us and the aging starts about 35 really so when you uh, when you look at the all the records that they are uh, in swimming and running and and weightlifting they show that from 35 no matter what athletes do they deteriorate about two percent so if you want to be the same you need to improve two percent if you want to improve two percent you have to improve four percent because this happens to you. But this is the road of the world champion. Of course, uh, the uh, purpose would be now to take person from uh, being weak and uh, having pains and improve. And then when you can see where the 80-year-old is, there's a huge gap between 80-year-old and the one that uh, doesn't train at all. So uh, this shows us that after five years, the, the records are going down. And this is the situation when uh, people choose how they actually, uh, after 35, when they are top athletes, they can go really down step, or they can go and, and become very youthful, even they are 100 years old. So what, uh, what can be done for... Uh, any regular person is the improvement is there. And there is a huge gap between anybody who didn't train and the one that is uh, powerful. So there is a huge reserve for everybody to improve. So I want to uh, show you now something special. So I coached this uh, several policy boy who came to me, he was 25 years old. When he came, he was lethargic. He was completely dependent on parents. He couldn't put the clothes on himself. And uh, he, uh, he, would, he couldn't focus for a minute or longer. Didn't have energy. So uh, uh, when I tested him, he, uh, the first day, he couldn't, um, he couldn't press. He couldn't take off the rack 15 pounds aluminum bar. He was so weak. And that's uh, after, this is one of his first days. Let me show you this, OK? So he's pressing this 15 pounds bar. Right. He's very weak, right? So uh, after two and a half years, the boy presses his body weight, 154 pounds. So 1,000 percent, 
difference. Two and a half years of work and thousand percent. So uh, his life completely changes because of it. He has now strength enough to read books, to go to school, to clothe himself, to go to toilet on his own. All of it happens because of the microprogression training and constant improvement of energy. What else happens is that his brain was very simple at that time. He could, uh, he didn't have any conversation because he didn't have in the brain uh, anything else than actually going to sleep or time to eat. So after about a year, I, I asked uh, father, so uh, what changed? And he said, well, we had a first conversation, mm. so something like that. Or that Tajen was in the car and he saw a car on the side. I said, so I didn't know uh, what was it about. But the father said that he was always sleeping in the car. And then one day he said, a car. So he saw the car. So his energy was keeping, started, started being, keeping him awake and more awake. So he, he uh, saw the car. I said, what was the car? He didn't know what was the car. So I said, next day when you drive home, uh, notice what the car. So he did. It was Toyota Prius or <laughs> Volkswagen. I said, who drove the car? And then he said, I don't know. So, so he remembered that. It was a woman or a man. And how old? So he needed to see that. Then it was on and on until he saw the driving license and all of these details. So his brain was really evolving. So I will show you uh, what happened after two and a half years of training. He had, he has a special moment because he presses his body weight. This is like, this is a big deal for anybody. It doesn't matter whether you are cerebral policy or not. Okay. Right here. So he is, he see, you see his leg is happy and then the expression of, so uh, his leg is very tight, his uh, uh, right uh, side of the body uh, has, is weaker than the left, so there are uh, some adjustments but the power is growing and overriding everything around, making him more uh, 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 like normal. So he is, uh, at the beginning, he's jumping here on, on one inch. When he came, he couldn't detach himself off the floor. He didn't have energy for that. All right, okay, sorry for this. All right, here is, he's trying to jump on one inch after probably about two or three months, and now he is jumping, trying to jump here on Do it. Yeah. 11 inches. So he tries it, and you can see how he drags his right leg behind. But he tries, and he tries. He has a really great spirit. He's like an, an athlete. And you see, when he does one time, his brain repeats it. Even five times, it's amazing. <laughs> you can see his energy now is really high. And, and it's, uh, it's powerful, and he's able now to almost do anything uh, what we actually do. So they gave me the idea that actually uh, it doesn't matter where we start, but it, what matters is that when we find where we start and make it better. Because when, when I coach athletes of all kind of ages, sometimes a, a, a tennis player comes in and is 12 year old. And I ask, okay, let's jump on box this height or this one. There's always a height when anybody is scared to jump on. So, uh, uh, so when, you know, when, when you cannot jump on one inch or 25 inch, it really doesn't matter. It, what matters is where you start and improve that. And his improvement is, because he starts very low, 
so he has this huge gap for uh, improvement. Yeah, we were, we were talking about that uh, before the talk this afternoon. And it was really striking because I sort of called out. I, I know people with cerebral palsy, and it was so dramatic, the improvement there. And that sort of punchline that, to a degree, we all have our starting point, whether your set point is 1 inch or 24 inches. Uh, it's really about how do you move from wherever you're starting and improve. And there may be more headroom uh, for uh, an average person like myself to where a top athlete is than even cerebral palsy to what we call normal. Right, so. because he improved you know, a thousand percent, but uh, normal probably people have about 300 percent. So I am 63 year old, but I'm a world champion at that age. So uh, any 63 year old that it will, I will face, it will be a lot of weaker than I am. It could be a lot of weaker, right? So when people come to my place and they find out that I am 63 years old and then I can do whatever I can do, it's just mind-blowing for them. But at the same time, it's very inspirational, very motivational. And the people see as, oh, I can be that way. So now I want to show you something else. This is a uh, 64-year-old uh, man comes into our place and, and trains for 11 years. He's 75 now. And he comes after 11 years and says, you know, I was 64 when I came here. And I, uh, I was weak. I was inflexible. I replaced two hips. Uh, yeah, and it, it was just really uh, my life was going down, right? But after 11 years... I'm a lot of better than when I was in 64. And actually, I can do things that I couldn't do when I was in 20s. So he performs full snatches See, with two hip replaced. He's 75. So if he is like that, so uh, there is a lot of room, really, what could be done. Uh, when uh, Tim Ferriss came to me about three years ago, he had some pains in his body because he really challenged himself and found himself to be sore in many places and inflexible. So uh, it took me about two years to, uh, to help him to, uh, to become flexible and, and do things like this. And he was able to do it after two years. But Tim Ferriss is a, a unique personality too because he always came with journal and he wrote all the notes and things. So he didn't waste time. And then it was very engaging every one hour when he was in my place. It was engaging. He understood the micro progression that uh, we do micro progression. And because of micro progression, uh, we uh, help people actually. Uh, to get better and better. So then, and then he knew that a lot of people come to our place and they, uh, uh, they, uh, they want to get better and they have difficult uh, uh, situations. So he called, uh, he called us uh, that we mend broken people. <laughs> so that was uh, Tim, Pel Tim Ferriss' uh, quote. Um, so something about the posture. You know, the posture is a, a very important, especially for people like you, computers, computers. I have a lot of surgeons that come and they just they do surgery like this, yeah? And they have a lot of pains in the back and then mostly thoracic spine. And so the program had to uh, face the whole uh, situation. So how do we really... Uh, break the posture, how we do age the posture. So the, the, the first thing that happens to us is that we break the, the thoracic spine by lowering the sternum down. So this happens. See, that simple when this happens, my head goes down too and my side lowers down. So in order to correct that, when it happens in the whole one year time, the head also moves up, you see? and adjust to that so the person can see yeah ahead and it's mostly kind of like that begins yeah but then when it really goes 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 uh, worse that the person cannot see 
ahead. So that's the next stage. The next stage is the knees forward, see? And then it goes like that, right? You can see that. And then more, that people are really tight at that moment, so they move more that way without moving the spine, yeah? So uh, once the knees are really tired, then the cane is the other way or the pusher, right? It's like you're aging before our eyes here. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> and, and then it, and then it's the, you know, that's the chair, yeah, sit, and then you're sitting, and it's hard to stand up. Okay, can so, you go back to yourself? <laughs> this is yeah. freaking me out. Yeah, okay, yeah, there that's you go. It. That's better. <laughs> cool. So, uh, uh, so the, it's the mindfulness and singularity and the posture and everything is uh, incorporating into one routine. Then you do uh, 30 minutes a day, and that's a whole routine. And in that routine of 18 exercises, the, the main purpose of, of the routine is one exercise, to be good in one exercise. It's like weightlifting. If you are good in snatch, you are good in anything in, in, uh, in your life. It doesn't matter whether you do skiing or skating or whatever. You will be great everywhere because that's the power of that one lift. So there are hundreds of exercises that weightlifters do, but they don't matter. They are only supportive exercises to make one happen, to be really the great in one. So we have that one. We call it power tower. So all these exercises is a routine. The, the routine is established with you know, three, ex three sequences, but mostly one is the aim. And then uh, that's how it looks. So uh, it is important here uh, for the posture and, and flexibility, there are three main parts of the body uh, really at stake here. Flexibility of the ankles, flexibility of hamstrings, and the spine. So when you have flexibility in these three places, you should be able easily de de uh, descend down without moving forward. So descending should be this way, see? Like this, and then up. So you're not doing this or raising your heels. So when you don't have flexibility, you will not be able to do that. But when you actually raise your arms up, it's even more difficult because the spine, the thoracic spine is at stake. So the, that exercise helps with the ankles, helps with the hamstrings, the hips, and then also the spine. So eventually you become like that, right? So that also gave us the idea that this exercise should be like clean and jerk. Now we transfer all the numbers toward that exercise, and that exercise became the standard for strength and standard for speed. If you are good in that, you are good to live life. And if you are good at that when you are 80, 90, well, you are good at that moment. So, uh, so we created the system that you would, when you are 30 and 40, you can actually uh, get better at that time. And uh, easily for you would be to be as strong as the eight-year-old when you are 30 and 40 and 50. And you keep that until you are 90 or 100. Fantastic life. Incredible. That eight-year-old Charlie Henderson, we uh, went on the banquet after the World Championship and we met him there. He came, he entered the room like this <laughs> with his wife you know, soft, the spine, the hips, everything. It's like, you know, 15-year-old, you know, like a ballet dancer is walking. <laughs> it's not like eight-year-old. His wife, 80-something too, and then she walked the same way. They pick up the champagne, and then they started talking. Like, you know, wow, you know, just like unbelievable. So we uh, really... Uh, engage them in the conversation, talk about nutrition, talk about the exercise, how you actually do this so your, your joints and everything stays really healthy and not being injured. And then we got a lot of tips how to micro progression could work and how with the age actually adapt yourself to it. Beautiful. So I want to encourage people to start thinking about questions. We have a mic over there. We'll, we'll have about 
uh, five minutes for questions. I just want to uh, ask a few more questions. Um, the being able to stick to this and like accessibility for anyone is micro progressions the key that makes this so uh, addictive and uh, that consistent and you know how does it work that you know not only athletes but normal people can or even people with cerebral palsy can adhere to a program like this so the uh, when we have certain weaknesses that we want to correct and then we have uh, the plan and strategy. So the happy body is that plan and strategy. Something else comes up, which is ability to apply. And that ability to apply we dealt with in the last 10 years after publishing the book, how to actually make it happen. During this time, I uh, uh, talk to my clients a lot about uh, Plato and, and horses and our emotions and, and, uh, and the mind, how that plays. And then he gave us a really great image. He said, imagine that your chariot is your body and the horses are your uh, feelings, emotions, and the mind is the rider. So he said that when the horses are dragging the rider against his will, danger is coming. So that's where addictions happen and all problems and so on. So I uh, thought about this long time and I was just and we focused for about six seven years of controlling those horses but whenever you control the horses something else happens is that we don't like it so we start being against it and we jump back and uh, so the how you actually uh, what do you do with the horses and uh, I came out with the idea that these horses have to be befriended. So uh, you, you work with poetry and the stories and then uh, um, talk to people around and you change slowly that, that brain patterns that those horses uh, align with the, whatever the mind wants. So the, at the beginning, when something is hard, so when you want to do something it, and it's good, you will not like it usually because it takes energy, takes uh, practice, uh, like you said. But when you keep doing it at the beginning, you, you're like a stoic. You want to control something. But you know, if you want to control something that is difficult, it's hard, then you will be uh, not liking it. So you can achieve it, but uh, you will be uh, more um, resistant and you will not be happy. But when you switch actually to the other side, then you become this, I call it a happy stoic, the happy stoic. The happy stoic is the one that is aligned with what is good, what needs to be improved, and actually likes it. So this is the example. I notice over and over that's what happens with the uh, losing weight. Somebody is 160 pounds and loses weight, becomes 120. But if the brain didn't shift, the person stays at 160. The brain is in 160. The body is in 120. And uh, if the brain is not shifted, then the brain will take back the body to 160. That's the lifestyle. And that is uh, here extremely important work that uh, takes the person from certain body weight to the other side and creates this uh, likability and the lifestyle of, uh, and the whole, change the whole believing system that you become, the person becomes 120, and the brain becomes, they start liking it. And it, it, it's, uh, it takes time, but once it happens, the happy story becomes. So uh, uh, for us, the recently is that uh, we, uh, like dance, and we pick up this uh, three months, four months, uh, our next uh, thing, 100, <laughs> 120 brain, yeah, the metaphor for it. So we, we go and we learn dancing and, and so on, and it's just, it takes hard, but you know, in some years, we'll be dancers. Yeah? Awesome. I want to make sure we have time for a few questions, so uh, I'll repeat them sure. uh, if you can't make your way to the mic. So, any questions? For Jersey, yes. So when you presented that, um, sing, I guess it's a singular exercise, the flow as you demonstrated that. If a person starts at a place where he or she can completely do that exercise perfectly, do they just keep, is your strategy keep doing that exercise and you will be better? Or 
can you do something else complementary to improve flexibility before you do that exercise as well? So what we do is micro progression. So we uh, set up, you know, the levels of squatting toward. So you find the person when the person is with the dumbbells up and squatting down. So you've, when it comes to the point when the heel's going up or the body leans forward, you measure that level and sit toward uh, that level. So we can, uh, and then when you uh, find that level, that you train until that level becomes comfortable. And then you sit one inch lower, one inch lower two weeks, three weeks, four weeks, five weeks, and you slowly, slowly going down and down until you uh, recover completely flexibility for that uh, particular exercise like power tower. So it is the same exercise? The same exercise. You progress. Yes, within. So you train it like doing pole vaulting. You, you, you are pole vaulter here, you, you power tower. So you, 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 you work with one exercise. So you know we can we can uh, uh, do with you just short thing. You can stand up and test yourself whether you can go down toward the chair. Stand up, please, and then you will see if you can do that. And put your uh, arms on your chest and try to sit back, sit back, and see if you can sit back without leaning forward. Right. So you can see that at a certain moment you just lean forward and. That is the moment that you need to start working with, right? You see, like, uh, and mostly, you know, we just squat that way and not using our hamstrings and hips and, and you know, other joints. So that, that question was great because it really helped me understand that one of the basis, bases of your system is that um, anyone can do it. It's a question of degree, like you said before. And uh, you can do this right and then continue with micro progressions to achieve more and more. So from day one, you can actually do the exercise. I just did it, I think, you know, part yes. of it. Um, and then it's a question of applying yourself and continuing to get better and better. So the, the whole system is built to restore a person from the level the person is. So if you find yourself... There are five levels for, uh, lo levels for every exercise. So if you find yourself in one exercise level five or another one level one, so you work with those levels, and when time passes, you will become better. It's a lot of data, too, because you are creating the same routine, and you are doing the same routine. And because of it, you, know, you start really learning about uh, what you do, and then... Uh, the data you collect, you are learning also about how to adapt that training system in, in case something happens. So you learn how to uh, increase the weight, you learn how to increase the depth uh, squatting or increase the speed. And, and you start really uh, working on it, becoming the self-coach. And uh, after a while, because you're doing over and over the same routine, you actually learn. You have the opportunity to it's, uh, it's a framework Googlers would like because it's an yes. experimental framework with one variable that you can measure. And, <laughs> or you take, know, take the tech generation that all the tech people will love the happy body because yeah. they love the science. It's, everything is science in the happy body, whether it's flexibility, whether it's strength, whether it's ideal body weight, whether it's uh, you know, leanness. Everything is in numbers. It's mathematics, all of it. So because of it, it's mathematics. You know, tech people and engineers love it. You say, oh, well, I love it. Oh, yes. And, and then they can do it for months and come back and, and, and uh, uh, you know, take the tune up a little bit. But uh, uh, mostly engineers are fantastic when it comes to, to their like things we can and, measure. And We're almost out of time. One more question from someone? Yes. I just wanted to ask you again sort of about adherence and that um, if you're a coach, right, Co coaches love athletes because you just give them a program and they do it. They want to get better. They want to succeed. They want to win. And I think often with, with non-athletes or, or normal people, even if you have a great program, if you don't stick to it, you're going to get suboptimal results. So have, have there been any sort of trends or things you've noticed when you work with someone about their ability to stick or not stick with the program? Like, 
where might someone relapse or, or where, might, where might they really succeed? Well, that's why in the, uh, the last uh, 10 years, we created a lot of uh, uh, help in that area. I, I wrote uh, three books of dialogues, and I noticed that we have a dialogue in our mind uh, between fatalists and the master, and the dialogue about the choices, uh, and one book is about dialogues uh, between fatalists and the master when it comes to food, the other one exercise, and the other one is about rest. And then there are 12 situations, and there is the dialogue between the fatalist and the master. You learn how to, uh, how to hear that you have those two first, and then you uh, learn how strong is the fatalist and how strong is the master, and learn how to uh, write down the situations and write actually uh, the, end the, the dialogue with the master of 51%. So if you can do that over time, you're actually getting better, all right? That's the three books uh, of uh, dialogues that work with it. The other uh, book is, uh, I got this, so it's the training the, the grid, that uh, reading stories, reading poems, and, and especially written by us. So you, you need to submerge yourself in the, uh, with people that actually do this, also read stories or uh, watch videos and everything that could help you to stay uh, on the track, right? Because really we don't know what words work in to the certain person and certain time. I, we noticed that you know after you know many years of uh, working with people that certain words work for one person but don't work for another one. For example, after four years, that woman came and she said, and I asked her, so how, how is it that you are able to uh, train this already for four years and then stick to it? And she said, you told me four words. Uh, and I said, what four words? Two years will pass, I told her. But I didn't remember. But these four words stuck with her. She imagined, she had the imagination that that two years will pass, and then uh, she will be in two years somewhere in the place, and engage her and inspire her to do the program until the end. So I want to close with uh, another uh, words. It is time. So uh, so it's the uh, um, I meet this uh, ballet dancer who was injured and who lost weight, and he gained back, that brain, 160 and 120. So uh, he, uh, he gained back the weight after about 10 years. I meet with him in LA, and I said, Barnes, you have to lose weight. Yeah, yeah, you have to lose weight. And then I said, it is time, and Barnes says, yeah, yeah, you know, it, when, when I did, I said, Barnes, it is time. And Barnes, yes, but you know, like I did it then, I said, Barnes, it is time. And Barnes looks at me, it is time? I said, yeah, it is time. And, you know, and, you know, like I said, yeah, it is time. I said, Barnes, I got it, it is time, it is time. So he goes home. And in about four or five months, loses 50 pounds. So we, we know that uh, somewhere the words and the story is very motivational and very powerful to do uh, uh, what you need to do. So, you know, let's say today you could think about... Uh, what you want to get better? What is that the one thing that you want to, uh, to go home and start improving? But if you want to really do that, you have to pick up one. Not two, just one. If you want to be flexible, pick up that one. And then start working with it. If you want to be strong, you do the strong. If you want to do, uh, uh, lose weight, do that. But just pick up one and start really committing to it, that you will do it every day. And priority, 
you will have priority for that one. So every day, no matter what, you will do this. And you will do this. And you start improving over time. All right. And you're like, so sorry. The what? Oh, yeah. So the hard choices is usually uh, aligned with uh, hard choices, easy, easy life. Is that what you want to improve? It needs to happen. It's like with the stoic. It's hard to start to control something what will make you better over time. And usually, we don't like it at the beginning. So we are the stoic controlling something. But we don't like it. And our challenge here is how to change, transfer, transfer the brain toward that goodness that you want to happen and like it. For me, it was two potatoes versus one potato. One potato, I love potatoes. I want more potatoes. But one potato, I know the happy body tells me one potato is enough not to uh, get fat. Okay, but I like two potatoes. Yeah, my horse is one, two potatoes, three potatoes, not one. So after a while, I, uh, but I choose one potato as a story, not two. But I, but I don't, I'm not happy either because I want two potatoes. So my big challenge here is how to transfer myself, transition myself to the one potato, and how to change my believing system that I actually like one potato. And that is the happy stoic. The happy stoic is that one. So today, I will choose one potato. I don't want two potatoes. I want one, one potato. But it's the whole experiences that happen throughout the year or two that build that transition. But it is possible, and it is really beautiful. So when you, when you pick up something, it will be hard choice. And it will be hard choice for a while. But when you really stick it, you go home and say, this is, I'm, not, I'm going to do it. And start working on it like we work with the dance. And even though it's hard, even though you have to wake up and do it, or you pay for it like we pay for the dance, it doesn't matter. But one thing, not two. One. OK, on that note, that will have to be the last word. Thank you. Uh, we really appreciate your enthusiasm. You're the living embodiment of what you teach. So thank you for that. Thank you, Roger. Thank you.